So, uh, broadly speaking, I mean, I'm going I'm going to talk about um, what we know about Mahavir, which is not that much. What we know about his predecessors, which is even less. Um, what the texts say about all of this, the nature of, so I'm giving you a broad outline, all right? So to think about the nature of um, uh, the religion, that will occupy the bulk of what we speak about. Uh, some remarks, obviously, about its history in India, um, how it has fared uh, over a period of time its central ideas and precepts, uh, including the idea of Ahimsa, but that's far from being the only one, the nature of the Jain community, uh, the fourfold distinction within, of, within the Jain community. We'll, I'll talk about that. Um, and I'm going to talk about Jain philosophy, particularly the ideas of Syadvad and Anek, Anekanantavad, um, and I will end with a story um, and suggest the significance of storytelling in the Jain tradition, all right? So I think that to the common person, I think Jainism, uh, from the word Jina, Jina is a conqueror. Uh, that's, you know, you can also translate it as a great teacher who has escaped or who has been liberated from the cycle of uh, rebirth, from, from karma, all right? But the, the word, if you had to use one English word to translate jina, it would be conqueror. Um, and the word jain is, jain is derived from jina. Uh, and I think it's important to begin with the understanding that, that in India, uh, the word conqueror has more often been used for people like Mahavir and the Buddha than for people who were military conquerors. I think it tells us something about the nature of our civilization, that the people who are most widely known and remembered in the long course of Indian history are people such as the Buddha, Mahavir, Guru Nanak, Mahatma Gandhi, Kabir, Right? It's the world conquerors, those who conquered the material world uh, to gain kingdoms. I'm not saying are unforgotten, but I think in the scale of things, they're, they're not, they are not the real conquerors. So you can either be a conqueror in the sense of acquiring a kingdom and acquiring material assets, or you can be the conqueror uh, of the worst aspects of being a human and get liberated. Uh, now, the idea of Jainism is principally, let's begin with some general formulations. I think it's generally, the general conceptions are that it's the religion more so than any other religion that, that has been associated with the idea of ahimsa uh, or nonviolence. Um, and in the West, um, it is certainly the case that throughout the... 18th, 19th century. I don't think that before the 18th century, I don't think anyone in the West even knew that there was such a thing called Jainism. Uh, the, the Kalpa Sutra, which I'll talk about, was translated in 1818. And it's one of the, one of the texts that's most widely known. And I think that that's the first English translation. And it has a, the biography of Mahavir. Um, there are some other things there too, but that's what it's largely about. Um, and this text, uh, which was translated by J. Stevenson, so in the preface he says, the Jains are now well known to the learned in Europe as the only representatives in Hindustan of the adherents to the tenets of Buddhism. In other words, mm -hmm. when he was translating it, in the West, it was... Jainism, to the extent that it was known, which was, which was very little, because it was really only maybe a couple of decades before Stevenson translated this, that people would have started becoming aware of Jainism, and that would have been only of the few of the really learned intellectuals who were interested in the teachings of the Orient, as it used to be called. 
uh, that at that time it was understood that Jainism was simply actually another word for Buddhism or that it was a branch of Buddhism. And Buddhism in turn was viewed by most people as being actually a branch actually of Hinduism. All right. So this is in 1818 from the Kalpa Sutra. And one of the slides you'll see is, is, the, um, is the cover page of the English translation. English translation. Oh, so, sorry, you broke up the last few sentences. Yeah, so I'm saying that the, the English, the, the, uh, the, in Europe, uh, the understanding was that Jainism was really a branch of Hinduism or another name for Buddhism. And Buddhism in turn was really viewed as something that was a branch of Hinduism for the most part. But I think there's no question that a lot more was known about Buddhism and a lot more is known about Buddhism even today in comparison to Jainism all over the West. And that's partly because Buddhism became a world religion a long time ago in the way in which Jainism didn't. I mean, I, I think that when we speak about Jainism, we have to understand that this is a religion that was really confined to India. It was confined to India. There were no Jains outside India. And it's only, of course, uh, in the late 19th century that you start to see the emigration of some Jains. And now, of course, we're talking about Jains living in the United States. Uh, I think possibly the first Jain who came to the United States was in 1893 uh, to the World Parliament of Religions, actually, uh, Veer Chand Gandhi to the best of my knowledge. But we shouldn't lose sight of the main point, which is that as this quotation from Jay Stevenson, which I have on the slide here shows, that he says that they are viewed simply as being those who are, adhere to the tenets, that is the principle of Buddhism. And, and six, seven decades later, one of the most well-known European scholars who, was, who would eventually go on to found a series called the Sacred Books of the East in 50 volumes, right? So that became the most authoritative, authoritative edition by which the, the, the philosophies and religions of the East, of India and China and Japan, became known to the West. So I'm talking, here's, and here I'm speaking about Max Mueller, and Max Mueller in his Gifford lecture, which is a very famous lecture that is delivered um, at Oxford, he doesn't even mention Jainism among the important religions of the world. And 20 years later, he lumps them with the, with the Buddhists, right? So the Jains were either viewed as being the same, same as the Hindus or being viewed as the same as the Buddhists. That was a popular perception. And I think if you now look at the popular perception, I think that, that in essence, Jainism is seen as a religion of extreme austerity. I think in India, uh, we have a better understanding because people know what role the Jains have placed, have played in Indian life. But I think that outside India, to the extent that anyone knows about Jainism, it's basically viewed as a religion of extreme austerity, particularly for monks or renouncers. So these people being people who walk barefoot, have no possessions, have no permanent residence. Um, and in the case of the Digambras, and again, we'll turn to that later on, the schism within the Jain, within the Jain religion between the Swetambras and the Digambras. But in the case of Digambra monks, going without any clothing, being completely naked, right? Um, complete abstention from sexuality, begging for food, that would be, I think, the most common conceptions about Jainism that, that really exist, I think. Now, it's very interesting that if you look at a book, which I think became the book that most educated people in India learned their history from, right, in the 1940s and going into the 1950s, 60s, and I recommend it very highly even today, although the book is now, 75 years old. I'm speaking about Jawaharlal Nehru's discovery of India, on which uh, a television serial was made in India, which is also worth watching. Bharat a coach, it's called. I think Shyam Benegal uh, was the anchor 
uh, who who did this discovery of India in 15, 20 episodes, maybe a couple of decades ago. But this book was published for the first time in 1946. And it's it's interesting just to take a couple of minutes to see what he says about Jainism, because again, it gives us a little sense of how, how this religion was, was really viewed. And in this case, viewed by a, a, a major Indian figure who was also a very learned person. I mean, Nehru was, may not have been a scholar in the traditional sense of the term. But, you know, when one reads Discovery of India, one is just marvels at how much he knew and how he was able to condense so much of Indian history into this magnificent book, uh, working largely from memory and from his reading, because much of it was written in jail when he was imprisoned by the British during various periods of time. Um, in the 1930s and 40s, he, he was reading away, uh, and, and then it's in the 1940s that he really begins to write this book. So he says, and I've given the exact citations and page numbers, he says that Buddhism and Jainism, you notice here again that, that the tendency has always been to view Jainism alongside Buddhism, right? That's usually how scholars, I mean, I, I would say that there are very few scholars in the world who study just Jainism only, uh, you know, whereas there are dozens, if not hundreds of scholars who study just Buddhism. Uh, I think most scholars who study Jainism actually study it in relationship to Buddhism or compare it to Buddhism. Uh, and, and I think it might be worthwhile for you to recall what I'd mentioned in, in previous lectures. Uh, when I was speaking about the about the seekers, the shramanas, right? Uh, that uh, that you have basically the Buddhists, you have the Jains, and then you have the Charvakas, or the Ajivikas, the materialists, whom I discussed in the post in the in the in the in the period immediately after the first set of Upanishads. So going back to about 600 BCE, that period, 600 500 BCE. So Nehru says, Buddhism and Jainism rather emphasize the abstention from life. And in certain periods of Indian history, there was a running away from life on a big scale. As for instance, when large numbers of people joined the Buddhist viharas or monasteries. And mind you, when I, when I quote this, I'm not suggesting that I agree with this view, but, it, but, but, but this view gives you an insight into the predominant view of Jainism among a certain class of Indian intellectuals as well, right? Which is that in a sense, Buddhism and Jainism, particularly Jainism began to be viewed as a kind of an escapism, all right? And then he says, uh, there was an ascetic aspect of life in India as it was later in Greece, but it was confined to a limited number of people and did not affect life generally. That aspect was, was to grow more important under the influence of Jainism and Buddhism. But even so, it did not change materially the background of life. That the Buddha, Buddha came along, the Mahavi came along, a certain kind of strand of asceticism became important in India, but this asceticism uh, and the monastic traditions it bred were really confined to a comparatively smaller number of people. Uh, of course, such an assessment ignores the fact that Buddhism, uh, unlike Jainism, became really, in many ways, the predominant religion for several centuries uh, in India. Just a question. Yeah. Well, why did, uh, according to him, why were there a large number of people uh, running away from life, so to speak, and um, joining monasteries and so on? Uh, why was that happening at, at a particular time? It, so, it, so you see, it, it, see he, the, the reason for that has to do precisely with the fact that the teachings of the Vedas and the Upanishads, even though the Upanishads themselves had moved away from the Vedas, and, right, as we had discussed, but nonetheless, they were, they were at a level of abstraction. They were at a level of abstraction, right? That's, that's a first consideration. That is that where people are thinking about what is the ethical life? What is the ethical life, right? What is the nature of right conduct? Now, you don't get answers to those questions, really, in the, in the Veda 
and in the Upanishads. What you get is you get in the Upanishads, you get a very abstract set of reasoning about the nature of knowledge, how is knowledge acquired, but in some ways they seem remote from everyday life. These seem remote, but your question is a very good one because the way in which he's put it, right? There was a running away from life and he doesn't really offer an explanation as such, he's, he's recording a phenomena that that's, and, and this is how he reads the phenomenon that it's a running away. Running away is a form of escapism that these are people, right? These are people who no longer can confront reality. So they want to retreat uh, into a monastic order. <coughs> but the explanation I'm giving is, is that in some ways people were seeking, they were hungry for, something that would speak to them in their everyday life. And this is where we're going to find both Buddhism and Jainism becoming important. Because if you remember the whole discussion of Buddhism, then what the Buddha is talking about is right livelihood, right conduct, right speech, all of that, right? Hmm. And so this is, I think, part of the reason. And then look at the third quote, from the same book, page 176, Buddhism had, um, oh, there's a typo there. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a typo there. Buddhism had defined, Buddhism had moral, defined value moral value of austere pessimism. Of austere pessimism. But the whole effect mm -hmm. of his teaching was one of pessimism towards life. This was especially the Hinayana view and even more so that of Jainism. I, I don't want to get into the Hinayana view because those are, those are differences within, within Buddhism, right? Mahayana Buddhism and Hinayana Buddhism. And, and that, that's, that, that takes us far afield. But it's the last part, even more so. That is that he's, he's saying that Jainism became identified with a religion that bred a certain kind of pessimism towards life. All right? So that, that's... And, and here we're not making an assessment of, of whether there is any merit in this view. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you these three quotations as a starting point for, for you to think about how a principal figure in the shaping of modern India in the 20th century was thinking about a religion such as Jainism. And, and none of this indicates disrespect for the religion from his from his standpoint. He, he simply characterized it and suggesting that this was the nature of the religion, right? And then, of course, we have to understand whether we agree with this assessment at all later on. And he's saying that about both Buddhism and Jainism. You can see that, right, from the quotations. Yeah. But, but yeah. he's saying that it's even more acute in Jainism. Even more so, this was especially the Hinayana view, and even more so that of Jain Jainism, pessimism towards life, pessimism towards life, you know. And, and when you read Discovery of India, you find that Buddhism appears quite often. Uh, the figure of Ashoka appears, the Buddha uh, Mahavir is, is just mentioned there, but then, but then whenever else there is a discussion, it's so Jainism, not, not not of Mahavid himself, whereas the Buddha appears a number of times. And I would say that, again, that that's really the case when you look at um, uh, Western histories of religions in India, that the Buddha by far became the dominant figure uh, here. Now, before we get into, before we get into, you know, some of the, some of the aspects of Jain philosophy and theology and the life of Mahavid and the history of the Jains, I might be just worthwhile very briefly looking at the religious demography of India. So if you take the, you know, we have a census every 10 years from 1951 to 2011. Uh, and there you see that Buddhism, uh, uh, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, Jainism, Sikhism, uh, Zoroastrianism, namely the Parsis, right? Uh, that you see that the Jain, Jain uh, percentage of the Jain population is, was 1951 census where the results came published in 52, uh, it, it less than one half of 1%, not even 1%, half, half percent. And it remained steady. And then the proportionately, the number of Jains has come down 
Uh, and then in the 21, 2011 census, we're talking about 0.37% of the population of India. Uh, what we're talking about is roughly four and a half million to five million Jains uh, in India. And I would say uh, no more than one million overseas, although that's a high number. Because in the United States, you would be about maybe 150 to 175,000. Uh, and then you can count Jains in Britain um, and you know Canada and elsewhere in the world. So, I mean, we're talking about five and a half million population of Jains worldwide, which would make it the smallest number of adherents of what can be called a distinct world religion. And when I say world religion here, I mean, I mean a religion with a, not with a worldwide expanse as such, but that is a religion with a very coherent, uh, you know, uh, uh, worldview uh, with, with, with text, with a, with a history, and with a continuous presence of something like 2,500 years, which is quite remarkable because that would be true of the other world religions too. Islam, of course, being the youngest of these major world religions, uh, Islam and, and Sikhism, right? But all the other religions date back to, to antiquity, Buddhism, Christianity, uh, Hinduism. Uh, so that's a religious, and in the, in the Republic of India, that is post 1947, post 1950 technically, uh, uh, because independence was in 47, but, but the Republic technically, technically comes into being on January 26, 1950, when the constitution became, uh, became the law of the land. Uh, Jains numbered 4.55 uh, uh, million in the 2011 census. They concentrated mainly in Western India and the states of Gujarat, Rajasthan, Maharashtra, and you have a population in Madhya Pradesh. Obviously you have numbers uh, of Jains in, in Delhi. Uh, for example, because Delhi is a huge metropolis. Uh, you know, given my profession, I buy books all the time. And, and at least half the booksellers in, in Delhi are Jains, if not more. You know, uh, the, the, the most, some of the most well-known pub, uh, publishing houses have been run by Jains. Uh, so they've been heavily concentrated in certain areas. Um, okay. Um, so if you look at, for example, Motilal Banarsidas, Munshira Manohar Lal, Manoor publishers, these are yeah. run oh, yeah. you know. I bought the books from Motilal uh, Banarsi Das. Yeah, okay, right. So yeah. now the constitutional status of Jains, most people don't realize that, was for a very long period of time very ambiguous. There were portions in the constitution, I remember when I first read the constitution of India, maybe 35 years ago, and I can't say that I read all of it because unlike the American constitution, which is only about 30 pages, uh, the Indian constitution is monstrously large. I mean, it's several hundred pages and it keeps on getting longer because they keep on having amendments to it, right? Uh, and the United States, an, an amendment to the constitution is a major event. I mean, I think the last time they had an amendment to the US constitution was something like 30, 35 years ago. So, the, so, and I remember when I read it, I remember that there were portions where it indicated very clearly that Jains were, were like Buddhists and Sikhs in being a branch of Hinduism. And then there were other portions of the constitution which seemed to indicate that Jainism was actually quite distinct. But if you take the Supreme Court view, which is really the way to look at it, so there's a decision, a Supreme Court decision of August 8, 2005, where the Supreme Court ruled that Jainism, Sikhism, and Buddhism are distinct, but nevertheless interconnected, and each related to Hinduism. And, and this could be the subject for a, a lecture unto itself, it's just exactly how are they interconnected, right? What does it mean to make that claim? But, but leave that aside. It's just worth noting that. And then the same Supreme Court, a slightly different bench of it, on August 21st, 2006, that is almost exactly a year later, ruled that, quote, the Jain religion is indisputably not a part of the Hindu religion. So they're saying it's distinct. It's distinct. And, and here also the question arises, what does common belief in India have to say? 
and, and when I say common belief, I'm not speaking obviously about the belief of Jains here. I'm speaking about what do most Hindus think? And I think that if you polled Hindus, I think most of them would say that Jainism and Hinduism are very closely connected. Yeah, that the Jains have some distinct views, but you know, they they are they they they're they're like they're like brothers of a kind. You know, I, I think that, that would that's what the common view would say of this question. And I only mention that because I'm saying to you, uh, which is a, a broader point, that sometimes one can have a official view of the matter, but then what people on the ground believe might actually be quite different, you know. The Jains were designated a national minority by terms of the National Commission for Minorities Act on 20 January 2014. And so, you know, when we, when the implications of this is that if you're a national minority, it means that there are certain kinds um, of privileges, certain kinds of protections that a religion enjoys or ought to enjoy in any case, you know, whether it actually enjoys it or not, because for example, Muslims are a national minority too, whether they actually enjoy their protection or in fact, to the contrary, you know, are really, uh, being persecuted, as some people would argue, uh, is obviously uh, an important question. I don't think there's ever been question of and any question, obviously, about the persecution of Jains as such. There have been occasions where there have been disputes, but uh, here the word national minority refers to the constitutional provision in a sense that uh, religion so designated would have certain kinds of protections. Um, and here I'm not going to speak about something which, again, I could go on for a very great length. Uh, and perhaps if there's time at the end, uh, and if we have any time left, I could speak to you about, about what I call the politics of minority and majority, why we have to be a little cautious about this kind of language. Um, and then finally, there is something like the diasporic presence, which I've already um, hinted at very uh, you know, a few minutes ago when I was talking about the presence of Jains uh, overseas. Uh, and now let's go to the early history of Jainism before we actually turn to uh, the lives of the 23rd and the 24th Tankaras, uh, that is Parshwanath and Mahavir. Um, so Jainism, as is the case with Buddhism, puts into question uh, Vedic ideology, that is, it questions the authority of the Vedas. Uh, the Jain Bhagwati Sutra refers to the Ajivika. So now you recall my whole discussion of the Ajivikas. The Ajivikas are also known as the Charvakas, the materialists. Right? And, and, and I alluded to them 10 minutes ago when I was talking about the Shramanic relig uh, 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 religions or the Shramanas, the seekers. Uh, those who uh, depart from uh, both the Vedas and the Upanishads, right? Uh, that, and, this is, and that age was an age of curiosity, intellectual questioning, the, the 600 BCE. Uh, so now the Jain Bhagwati Sutra refers to the Ajivika founder uh, as Goshala uh, and characterizes him as having been a disciple of Mahavir's for a period of six years before they went their own ways. Apparently they, they, they spent time together uh, practicing austerities, uh, but then at some point their paths diverged, uh, partly because some of the Jain texts suggest Gosala was an intemperate person, uh, a person who was prone to, uh, to sudden outbreaks of anger and temper, uh, and uh, eventually they decide that they're going to part company. Uh, of course, this is, it's the Jain text which is telling you that because I very much doubt that any Charvaka text would say this. That is that this is where texts obviously become very partisan, that if it's a Jain text, then it's going to represent Mahavira as the one who was the superior and Goshala was his, was his disciple. Um, I, I doubt that any Charvaka text would, would in fact actually agree to such a characterization. Uh, and so here we are not assessing whether this is true or not. With this, we are looking at what one Jain text actually says. Um, 
It's very interesting um, that Chandragupta Maurya, whom we have not gotten to because uh, you know we went into Buddhism and then the Mahabharata and, and the Ramayana and all of that. Uh, but Chandragupta Maurya, uh, and that would that would be the next that would be the next subject would be the Mauryan Empire, uh, who presided over the Mauryan Empire and founded it, is thought to have converted to Jainism. This this is what all the Jain texts tell us. Um, there seems to be some incidental um, um, affirmation of this from non-Jain texts as well. So there's really no reason to discredit this view. Um, and so, you know, he's the founder of what becomes the first great empire in India. He's the grandfather of Ashoka. Um, and he renounces his empire, handing over power to his son Bindusara, uh, takes up the view, vows of the Jain monk, uh, and treks all the way down to South India to present a Mysore to a place called Shravan Bela Gol. Have you ever been there to Shravan Bela Gol? No. Okay. All right. So you know, if you go to Shravan Bela Gol, it's a it's a great site of Jain pilgrimage, and there's one of the world's largest uh, monolithic statues in the world. Uh, over the Dankra mm. is over there in Shravan Bela Gol. I went there 30 years ago. Um, so this is in the south, in 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 Mysore, uh, and and Chandragupta Maurya is is said to have gone down there. Of course, this suggests to us, as we as we'll find out in just a moment that Jainism had, had begun to spread because even though it develops in the Gangetic Plains, uh, you know, in the north, now we're talking about uh, Chandragupta Maurya having gone all the way down to the south, which should be well over uh, 1,000 kilometers, well over that 2,000 kilometers, right? Uh, and Chandragupta Maurya, according to the Jain tradition, is said to have died by fasting, uh, a practice which is known as salekna, Right, and 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 um, we'll we'll get to a little bit more of that practice of salekna later on. Uh, there is an Ashokan edict. So, Ashoka, as mentioned in my lecture on the Buddha, on Buddhism, you know, made known his teachings. Okay, um, by putting up these edicts, rock edicts and pillars where his teachings and pronouncements and were actually carved on stone. So we have an Ashokan rock edict. And when I say Ashokan rock edict here, now I'm talking about 300 BCE. I mean, you know, 250 BCE. And this Ashokan edict says, Pia Dasi, Pia Dasi is the, the person who is the beloved of the gods, right? And this, so this is this is this is uh, Ashoka's name for himself, who is loved by the gods. Spoke thus: My supervisors of law are dealing with many connected with mercy, and also with those which concern the ascetics, and those which concern the householders. So you can see, incidentally, that there's already a distinction between ascetics and those who are householders. That is, that those who are at the stage of grehast the four stages of life, so brahmacharya, then you get the householder, grihast, and then you get the ascetics, those who have now gone into vanaprastha, right? Who those who are beginning to take, uh, beginning to go into the mode of the life of the renouncer. They deal with, and he says that officials working in my kingdom, right? D deal with all of these kinds of people. They deal with religious brotherhoods as well. I have made arrangements so that they will deal with the matter of sangha. That is that they will be attentive to their demands. That and this and when he says sangha here, he is talking about about the Buddhist community. Similarly, I have made arrangements so they deal with the Brahmins and also with the Ajivikas. So it, this tells us that at least two hundred and fifty years after the Buddha and Mahavir, the Ajivikas were still around. The materialists were still around. This, this school of thought hadn't disappeared. It would eventually disappear completely, but they were still around. And I have also made arrangements that they deal with the Niganthas. And Niganthas are the Jains. Okay, this is another term for the Jains. They, uh, this is a long history, which we won't get into because it'll get us into, a, into 
the the whole question of uh, who is Niganta uh, and what kind of teacher he was, but this is Niganta Nataput. Uh, he is a contemporary of the Buddha and his followers um, are called the Nigantas, but, but we know from sources that the Nigantas and the Jains are one and the same. And of course, logically it stands that they are not the Buddhists because he has already identified all the other communities separately. When he says a Sangha, it means the Buddhists. When he says the Brahmins, well, it's self-evident, Ajivikas and the Jains. Right? And I have made arrangements so that they will deal with all the religious brotherhoods. What this rock edict, of course, points to is the, is the fact that Ashoka was and, and he justly becomes known for that, he was a person of immense religious tolerance, right? So that at this point in time, we can say 250 BCE, we can say that the Buddha, Buddhists, the Ajivikas, the Brahmins, and the Jains were all coexisting in their own respective communities, you know. So to give a broad overview, a very broad overview, just a few minutes, and then we turn actually to uh, the historiography, okay? Uh, history and historiography of the Jinas uh, and Mahavir. So Jainism, parallel to the spread of Buddhism from Magadha, spreads to the south of India. And as well- Oh, so, sorry, quick question, Vinay, before I forget. Yeah. So we said Maurya, Maurya converted to Jainism. Chandragupta Maurya. Was, yeah, Chandragupta Maurya. Chandragupta Maurya. Yeah. And he yeah. is the grandfather of uh, Ashoka. who later became Ashoka. Yeah. Emperor Ashoka. Yeah, yeah. He's the grandfather of the great Emperor Ashoka. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, and Ashoka himself converted to Buddhism. He yep, exactly. Buddhist. That's why. Yeah. He himself was a Buddhist. Yeah. All right. Hmm. Okay. okay. So, but, but you see, uh, we can say from this early period that Jainism had spread to the south, right? Because remember that Chandragupta Maurya goes all the way down to what is present in Mysore to, to Sharan Bela Gol. Um, and, and we know, of course, that there was a considerable Jain presence up in the north. Um, Mahavir himself, as we're going to find out, is, is born near present day Patna, not too far from it in Daishali, right? So, so it spread at that point in time, it's parallel to the spread of Buddhism, just like Buddhism had begun to spread, so, so, was, so did Jainism. Mathura, which is not far from Delhi, Delhi, Agra, right? And Mathura is, is, is associated, of course, with the, with the legends of, of Krishna, Mathura and Rindavan, that area, uh, becomes well known as a place that was hospitable to Jains, uh, especially under a, a, an empire known as the Kushans. Uh, the Kushans are a Indo-Bactrian. Uh, so it, it, the political history of India, uh, immediately at the time of the beginning of the common era, that is at the beginning of after the birth of Christ, uh, if you're using the Gregorian calendar, uh, and for, for several centuries after that, the political history of India is, is uh, very complicated. You don't have one single empire because the Mauryan Empire had broken up, uh, and the Kushans ruled over portions of North India, but they were smaller competing kingdoms, and then the rest of India was under different under different rulers. Uh, but that the Kushans who, who come from uh, southern China, southwest China, and merging into Central Asia, okay, uh, with some Greek influence because Alexander had left behind uh, Greek garrisons in all of these places, all right? So that's why they're called the Indo-Bactrians. Uh, th this, uh, uh, under the Kushans, uh, we know that Mathura becomes a place that is very hospitable to Jains because there are lots of remnants of Jain monuments um, over there. So, you know, large, uh, large sculptures of the Tirthankaras, of the Jinas, their stupas, all of that. Uh, 
And then under the Guptas, who succeed the Kushans and then create what, call, what is called the Great Gupta Empire, the Jains had fairly close ties to the Guptas. Uh, we know that they received patronage from some local kings as well, regional kings, and coastal merchants, all right? So when I say coastal merchants here now, I'm talking about Western India. So I'm talking about Gujarat, uh, present-day Maharashtra, that region, all right? Um, but in the meantime, and we'll come to that late, later on, a schism has developed, okay? Be between the Digambras and the Shwetambras. So the two main branches, if we, if, if we can put it that way, of Jainism. Uh, there are other branches too, but these are the two main branches uh, of Jainism. So some people turn to asceticism, but some Jains turn to trade and commerce. And, and at this point, I might just say that, you know, that, that if you're looking at Jains, you find that Jains are preeminently involved and have been for centuries in, in trade, in commerce, running shops, running businesses, being entrepreneurs, because there were lots of professions that were close to them. They were close to them because, for example, they didn't, they didn't take to farming. The reason they didn't take to farming, to agriculture, was because agriculture would involve the loss of life. You, you're plowing the land, you're going to be killing insects and other insects, okay? So they, 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 they couldn't be beekeepers because then you're dealing with bees and, and, and uh, you know, you have to deal with, you have to deal with uh, uh, living creatures who, who uh, you know, are going to be killed as well. Uh, and you have to deal with, 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 with that kind of thing. So what, what you find is that they are basically people who take to trade and commerce, and you can see this already during the time of the, of the, of the Guptas. Um, the thing is that Jainism's base remains very small. Why that was a case will be understood when we look at the structure of the religion, when we look at the austerities that were demanded, not just of the renouncers, but of, of people who were lay people, lay men and lay women, all right? And in the South, the evidence seems to suggest that Jainism, which had been established there at the time of Chandragupta Maurya, so roughly 300 BCE, right? That by the 12th century, Jainism's roots in the South had pretty much vanished. You really didn't have any Jain communities in the South anymore. But, uh, and, and, and all of this I'm condensing here because these are very complicated developments that, that what's happening in Shaivism and Vaishnavism, now I'm using those terms, not Hinduism, because as I've argued many times before, and I think you'll find the most serious historians will not use the word Hinduism because there was no such thing really. There was Shaivism, Vaishnavism, there was Tantrism, um, uh, Shaktoism. But within the Shaivite and Vaishnava branches of Hinduism, uh, there had been several reforms and many of the people within those, they had taken to trade and commerce too, which meant that Jains now had competitors because for many centuries, they were really the ones who were dominating that. And all of this is going to lead to some decline in numbers for the Jains. Um, but it, what's interesting is that throughout, so um, you continue to find dynasties that are giving patronage to Jains, patronage. And when I say patronage, what does it mean? It means donations to build temples. So, so there is a Jain Narayan temple in Patadakai, which is uh, under the Rashtrakuta dynasty in, in Western India in, in Karnataka. Um, and um, uh, the famous, extremely famous complex at Elora, okay, the Ajanta and Elora caves, right? Which has actually a Jain temple too. It actually has a Jain temple there, right? And that, and the, the, the Elora temple, because the, temp the Elora temples are built over a period of time. It's not like they were all built at the same five, 10 years. They were built over a period of several centuries. Uh, and the Jain temple dates back to this period, which is, the last period really of the construction of temples in Elora from 730 to 950 CE. 
So even though, even though, even though, to some extent, uh, we are finding that Jainism's roots are disappearing for some places, we find that yet in other parts of India they're still receiving considerable patronage. So now we get to the question of the origins of Jainism. And what do we mean by origins? Because I think that, you know, if you study it from the point of view of, a, of the other religions, then you think about, particularly if you study it from the point of view of Christianity, Islam, Sikhism, Buddhism. Now, all these four have a historical founder, right? So uh, Jesus, Muhammad, uh, the Buddha, um, and Guru Nanak. Uh, and I, I think that generally when people are in the quest of the origins, they're thinking about a historical founder. Uh, and, we, and we know that Hinduism doesn't have a historical founder. And although I don't think most scholars would put it that way, but I think if you press them, they might perhaps not entirely disagree with what I'm going to suggest to you here, which is that in some ways we can put Jainism somewhere in the middle there. That is that it does have a historical founder, but the Jains themselves do not necessarily think of him as a historical founder. That's the interesting thing. Okay, and I'll explain that. Um, so, so first I'm just simply raising the question at a, at a level of abstraction. Uh, and that is, what do we mean when we think about the conception of a historical founder and how important is that to a religion? The Jain view is that religion, their religion is actually eternal or has been founded repeatedly. Okay, that, that this religion was there millions of years ago. Now in this present yuga, this present age in which we are living, the most recent cycle, we can speak of 24 founders. So when you often hear of the Tirthankaras, the 24 Tirthankaras, it is a reference to these Tirthankaras in our yuga, in our age. But our age doesn't mean the age of you and me and people going back two, 3,000 years, not at all. Because what we find is that the only two Tirthankaras about whom we can say that they are historical in some sense are the last two Tirthankaras. And those are Parshwanath who dates back to about the 8th, 7th centuries BCE, and then Mahavir, for whom we have a concrete set of dates, although the Digambara tradition gives you a slightly different date for the year that he attained moksha, okay, that is when he passed uh, eternal moksha, okay, when he went into the Siddha Lok, okay, uh, the Digambras give that end date as 510, his death date as 510 BCE. The, in the Shwetambra tradition, it's 527 BCE. And the press, predecessor of Parshwanath, that is the 22nd Tirtankara, Neminath, is said to have lived about 75,000 years ago. So, so immediately it tells us two things when you look at this chronology. The first thing it tells us is that the only two of the Tirthankras out of the 24 who are historical are Parshwanath and Mahavir. And then all the other Tirthankras are what you might describe as figures of mythos. Now, I don't think the Jains would necessarily define it that way, but remember that the Jain view, actually, if you interrogate the Jains and, and what they think, they simply will tell you that the religion has been there forever. So it's been eternal. And that this is, there are constant cycles where you have 24 founders. This is the most recent cycle. But within this cycle, you can then make a distinction between the last two and the preceding 22. And then within the last two, you can make a distinction between Parshwanath and Mahavi, because we know a lot more, which is still very little. You have to always remember that, and you'll see why 
in just a moment, when you, you know, I give you a few quotations from one of the texts, we know very little about even Mahavir, but we know the, even the little that we know is still a lot more than we know about Parshwanath. All right. So now the founder, the first of these Tirthankaras is said to have been Rishabnath. And Rishabnath would have lived hundreds of thousands of years ago. Because namely not the 22nd Tirthankara lived 75,000 years ago. And the first real source where we even encounter him is actually a 9th century CE text. So we're talking about a text that's about 1200 years old. A work called the Adi Puran. Notice the word Puran, as in the Puranas that we have seen, the Hindu Puranas, okay? Uh, and 